Uh, welcome to our celebration of 40 years of the Japan Research Centre, or as we call it, the JRC. I'm Helen McNaughton, I'm the current chair, and I welcome in particular the Japanese Ambassador, His Excellency Ambassador Tsuruoka, and I also welcome long-term supporters of the JRC, colleagues from across SOAS, our students, our visiting scholars from Japan, and last but not least, my fellow JRC members and family and friends as well. I'm going to try and cover 40 years of history in 10 minutes, so hold on tight. <laughs> As many of you will know, SOAS celebrated its centenary a couple of years ago, so the study of Japanese language and culture has actually been with us for over 100 years. And while 40 years might not sound as significant, I think the smaller big numbers are worth celebrating as well. The JRC was established back in May 1978 by Professor William Beasley, eminent scholar of Japanese history at SOAS, and it was apparently named by uh, Professor Pat O'Neill. It was founded with four, uh, three core remits. The first, to assist in the promotion of academic research on Japan across SOAS. Second, to provide seminars on topics of scholarly and public interest. And third, to organize a regular program of visiting scholars from Japan, all of which we still do, and more, as I'll, as I'll show you. In the 1970s, the study of Japan was expanding, and SOAS was at the <coughs> forefront of that expansion. An article in the Times Higher Education Supplement in March 1978 said the following, Japanese studies in the United K Kingdom is probably about to enter a new phase of growth. The economic and political power of J Japan demand it. Its complex history, society, and culture deserve it, and the natural thrust of Japanese studies in the UK invites it. The decision to form the JRC was taken at Academic Board in January 78, and in May, the SOAS director, Professor Cohen, wrote to the Japanese ambassador at the time, uh, Tadao Kato, saying, quote, we have taken the decision to set up what we hope will be a lively and productive institution here, irrespective of the outcome of the discussions now going on about possible allocation of Japanese funds for these purposes. We take this step as an indication of our commitment to Japanese studies, and of our belief in the importance of the links between this school and Japan. I also found early correspondence with the Japan, to the Japan Foundation inquiring about the possibility of funding. Some things never change after 40 years. <laughs> but I think it shows the strength of our relationship to have Tsuruoka, Ambassador Tsuruoka here, and Embassy staff here, and Takatori-san from the Japan Foundation London here tonight. So thank you for your enduring support over the last 40 years. In 1977, uh, sorry, Beasley recorded that SOAS had for many years run courses relating to Japan in the fields of language, literature, geography, history, and sociology, but that the school was expanding into the social sciences to include economics, law, and politics. The JRC was established back then with 11 members of staff, and one of those 11 is here tonight, Professor Christopher Howe. Where are you, Chris? <laughs> So Chris, Chris was initially a specialist on the Chinese econ economy who extended his interest to include Japan as well. So welcome, or rather should I say thank you for never fully retiring and still, still being with us here. Uh, Richard Sims, also another founding member, wrote to me and said he regrets that he couldn't join us here tonight and he wrote saying, in the light of the present day when the JRC is so active, you might be surprised how limited we were in its role in its early years. For the first 10 years, we focused mainly on seminar talks, encouraging outside speakers and foreign scholars, but these were far fewer than is now common. Having said that, the JRC did get involved in 1981 in the Great Edo Exhibition held in the Royal Academy um, and hosted exhibition talks on Japanese art. The next two chairs were John Sargent, another founding member. Uh, he led the first JRC multidisciplinary research project into the Hokkaido region of Japan in the mid to late 80s. And the next chair, Philip Harris, um, focused on the theme of education and national competitiveness. And he hosted the first one day workshop on teaching Japanese language as a foreign language in 87. But the activities of the JRC started to really expand in the late 80s with the enthusiasm of the next chair, Kaori Sugihara. In addition to the regular seminar series, he organized conferences on themes including Japan and the Middle East, the Japanese economy and financial systems and environmental policy. And he also ran an additional seminar at the time with Janet Hunter from the LSE for nearly 11 years on the economic and social history of Japan. 
Um, he also started the Postal Bulletin, JRC News, which over, over time developed into our current e-bulletin. And he ensured that the centre received dedicated administrative support and its own financial accounts. In correspondence with me this week, Kaoru wished us a happy ce celebration and said that during his time as chair, Japan's bubble economy meant that it was very much at the centre of attention. And such themes were deemed to be important to include at SOAS alongside more traditional themes, uh, fields that had been running for some time. Uh, the next chair, John Breen, also sent us best wishes from Japan. He said that for him, the most memorable activities were creating the JRC annual lecture series in 2003 and thereby establishing our relationship with the Meiji Jingu Research Institute, which continues to run. Um, we had our annual lecture last year. It's now in its 11th year, supporting a lecture series, PhD scholarships, and small research grants. And John said that running the JRC involved very fun initiatives and it played an essential part in stimulating research and thinking on Japan, and even commented that until the JRC came along, Japanese academics devoted themselves almost entirely to teaching, so clearly we weren't as sociable back then. Over time, our programs have expanded, of course, so now we have to include more fields, uh, including Japanese art history, anthropology, film and media, religion and music, and later we're going to showcase some of these fields to you. The next five chairs who steered the centre for the last 20 to 25 years are all still members of the JRC, so once we grab good people, we don't let them go. Steve Dodd, currently on sabbatical in Tokyo, sent this message saying, serving as the JRC gave me the opportunity to engage with a range of visiting scholars and speakers, offering new and stimulating ideas, and he even went so far as to say the JRC is a jewel in the crown of SOAS. The other four chairs are here, so I'm going to ask them to take a little bow. Drew, Gerstel. <laughs> Uh, Tim, Tim Screech, <laughs> Angus Lockyer, yes, up there, <laughs> and, and Chris Gertis at the front. <laughs> so centre activities continued to flourish with them. Too many to mention, but I'm going to highlight a few. Drew formed the JRC Steering Committee and held two big conferences on 18th and 19th century Kansai. Tim helped negotiate the arrival of the Sainsbury's Institute, SISJAC, which appointed annual fellows in Japanese art and a large donation to the SOAS Library. He also led the Later Japan 400 project in 2013-14, which the JRC co-sponsored. And he helped negotiate a very generous donation from the late uh, Kayoko Tsuda, which enabled the JRC to run a Tsuda lecture series and PhD scholarships for 10 years until 2016. Angus launched our JRC Annual Review, now in its 10th year, held the first translation workshop in 2009 with Chris Gerdes, and organised the uh, British Association for Japanese Studies conference here. He also took our former SOAS director, the late Paul Webley, to Japan for the Meiji Jingu 90th anniversary celebrations in 2010. Chris Gertis brought the editing of the Badgest Japan Journal, uh, journal into, J into the JRC, Japan Forum, as well as his monograph series, SOAS Studies in Modern and Contemporary Japan. And Chris also launched our annual W.G. Beasley Memorial Lecture, now in its fifth year, and named, of course, after our founder, William Beasley, which almost brings us full circle. Well, William Beasley, during his lifetime, was made a fellow of the British Academy, as have Chris Howe, Drew, and Tim been made fellows as well. And these are merely the highlights over the decades. Many, many others in the room, other JRC members, have contributed significantly. Um, special mention to David Hughes, who's in the audience, who, there he is, this year. <laughs> this year was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun from the Japanese government for a career promoting the understanding of, of Japanese music. Now, you might ask, are there no women in Japanese studies at SOAS? <laughs> While, well, the, it's true that we were scarce on the ground in the 11 founding members. I think there was one uh, woman. But I'm pleased to say that we now have 30 academic staff members, plus 30 research associates and, and visiting scholars at any one time, and around half are women. You'll be pleased to know I did a quick test. 
So as somebody who researches gender in the workplace, I'm proud to be the first female chair of the JRC in its 40-year history, but this is merely historical accident, as any one of the great female colleagues in this room could be standing here too. So I want them to stand up too. Barbara, Japanese linguistics, Barbara Pizzicone. <laughs> Lucia, uh, religion, we're gonna hear more from her later. <laughs> Griseldis, film and media. Uh, Mary Arici, uh, art history. Uh, Yoshiko Jones, sensei, yeah. Japanese language. Um, Kashiwagi sensei, yeah. So, uh, can I say, Kashiwagi sensei is retiring after 30 years teaching language here at SOAS, is that correct? We don't want her to go, but. <laughs> Um, Fujiko, our SOAS librarian, may be here as well. Um, and uh, Furukawa, sorry. And Furukawa Sensei couldn't make it. And of course, the wonderful Jane Savory, without whom we would not function on a daily basis. So, like uh, the chairs before me, I hope I too am leaving my mark on the JRC. Uh, I led the EU-funded executive training program for Japan. Uh, with Chris Gerdes, I organized the Dulwich Boys Centenary Celebration that we had of Japanese studies here. I've overseen the annual Sasakawa Scholarships Program, generally, generously funded by the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation. Thank you, Brendan, where are you, for your enduring support of Japanese studies. Um, and I also led the bid for the JRC to be the new institutional home for the British Association of Japanese Stati uh, Studies. And with support from the Japan Foundation, Toshiba and Japan Sports Council, I established our new sports symposia series, which will run until Tokyo Olympics 2020. While I was reading through the records um, to prepare for tonight, I was struck by two things. The first was the fantastically rich and, and diverse range of activities that we've done over the years, and I really could only mention a few, and also the enthusiasm of all the JRC members recording those activities. At the same time, I was also struck by the constant concern for Japanese studies in terms of funding and sustainability. Um, and yet, here we still are 40 years later, in the spirit of Fuwaku, uh, Fuwaku is very difficult to translate, and maybe the ambassador can help me in a moment, but I'm going to offer one very loose and lengthy translation. Uh, standing steady without hesitation, following the right course past 40. So, <laughs> very long translation. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that in our 40th year of the JRC seminar series, we have for the first time received a donation to sponsor the seminars this year from Mr. Ichikawa, who is president of Ichikawa Jin, a customer relations and advertising company in Japan. And this is thanks to the friendship between Ichikawa-san and our JRC senior fellow, Stephen McAnally. So what I would like to do is use this first donation to launch an initiative called the 4040 Fuwaku Fund, and the goal is to sustain the JRC through the next 40 years with a target of 40 companies or individuals or institutions. So 4040 sponsoring at least one or contributing to one JRC activity a year. No donation too small, all are welcome. <laughs> so I might not be around to see that uh, come to its fruition in 2058, but I'm confident that the women and the men who steer the JRC going forward can carry on the momentum of Fuwaku. Thank you. I'd now like to call upon His Excellency Ambassador Tsuroka to say a few words. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I'm uh, amazed that, uh, uh, well, first of all, I have to apologize that I am uh, here for the first time. Even, I've, uh, even though I've been uh, in London for two years and now three, four months, uh, I just realized that this really is the center. The, the name center uh, represents uh, the institution only too well. I met, I'm meeting all my friends that I've uh, met since my arrival in London who have work very hard to promote relations uh, between uh, Japan and the UK. The relationship between our two countries is indeed very precious and I would say priceless 
I don't know if you could put a price on relationship, but to me, it is indispensable, especially today. And in order for Japan and UK to collaborate and work together, we need to enhance mutual understanding. It is really rewarding for me as ambassador here in UK to have so many people, and we just heard the history of 40 years. Of course, this is also preceded by SOAS uh, celebrating centenary two years ago, where my predecessor, Ambassador Hayashi, attended. It is based on having a real understanding of each other, and without which collaboration never works. Because countries, in a way, survive forever. Good or bad, it's your judgment. Uh, the Japanese emperor has been forever, so does the EU British uh, monarchy. I am ambassador to the court of St. James. So first, I think UK and Japan, uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland and Japan has indeed a very, very strong basis to promote friendship to the service of the world because two countries alike cannot survive without stability and prosperity in the whole of the globe. And as two countries that can make a difference, Great Britain, of course, has been making a difference for many, many centuries, uh, having ruled the world at one time, but still continue to be a permanent member of uh, United Nations Security Council and a strong voice in all issues around the world, including global issues. The conference on uh, uh, endangered species, uh, which will focus on uh, illicit trade of uh, ivory, for example, is being hosted here in London for the f uh, as the fourth conference of the kind. It's a British initiative. A Japanese uh, a parliamentary minister, uh, a lady, by the way, uh, is arriving, has, must have arrived and that's why I will have to leave and uh, uh, host dinner for her uh, after this, I'm sorry to say that. But uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, initiatives and work that uh, UK has been promoting, and Japan on our part uh, have also tried to do our own contribution to the world. But no one country can sustain or improve or enhance global prosperity anymore. Unless we work together, we cannot ensure peace and stability as well as prosperity that will benefit all. And in order to have a very a reliable partner who you can trust, you need to understand and you need to know each other. And this is the great contribution that SOAS and JRC has been making over the last 40 years. 1978, is two years after I joined the foreign ministry. So I'm a bit older than JRC <laughs> in professional career, I should say, uh, and I am still surviving. Um, it's a good initiative to call for another 40 years of the good work of JRC, and I hope that uh, there will be supporters and participants who will keep this tradition alive. Uh, we can all be very proud and I'm not individually contributing to this, but uh, I'm very happy that my government has consistently promoted uh, the work of SOAS and in particular JRC. I need to mention one name that I'm indebted to since my arrival in London, who recently passed away, unfortunately, and that's Sir Hugh Cortazzi, who is a graduate of SOAS, who has pioneered promoting Japanese understanding in UK and left a legacy that we can all benefit in the form of many writings and also old maps of Japan. Sainsbury Institute uh, uh, in Norwich has uh, a collection. And I think it's uh, his past that uh, we are now asked to follow because there are many precedents, many people who have made today happen, and it is up to us now to continue that work. I am not, may not be the oldest person in the room, uh, but 
we need to depend on the younger generation to continue the good tradition that we have inherited. And it is up to us, now that we may be leaving a few years' time, to make certain that this tradition continues on and the academic excellence of the London University, SOAS, and JRC continue to flourish. One last word. I really am very grateful that a foreign person, a non-Japanese person, has taken the initiative of establishing JRC and has maintained the work all along. It is a gratitude that I must express as a Japanese. It would have been very difficult for a Japanese to do it. And that is the basis of the collaboration that I think we can trust and continue to rely on each other. Thank you all very much and congratulations. Thank you, Ambassador. And I know that you have, you've got a busy schedule and you have to leave and you can't join us for sake, but um, maybe another time. But thank you for coming along. We very much appreciate it. So now we're going to take you on a little tour of the kinds of research that we do here at SOAS. And I've got eight JRC members. And I've asked them to speak for five minutes each, which is really difficult for academics because they <laughs> just like to drone on. Uh, so eight of us are going to talk for five minutes each, hopefully nice visual presentation. So about 40 to 45 minutes showing you what we do, showcasing what we do at SOAS here. First up is Andrew Gerst. Drew Gerst. Um, thank you, Helen, for organizing all of this. You did a great job so far. And uh, thank you all for coming. I was afraid this great big hall might be sort of empty, but it's nice to see we have so many friends and supporters. Um, speaking about telling your whole life, in, uh, and I'm one of the older ones, in five minutes is not uh, a pleasant prospect, actually. <laughs> um, my little theme of the five minutes is uh, serendipity, or chance. Uh, so many times things happen that lead us to, we don't expect that things happen. In my case, uh, when I was 19, without any knowledge or interest in Japan, uh, a chance came to go to study at Sophia University in front of my eyes, and I just said, oh, this sounds like fun adventure. And it led me around the world from America to uh, well, Japan, but also Australia for 12, 13 years, and finally to London. Why did I go continue to research? When I was at Columbia University, I had a really excellent Shakespeare teacher, actually. And I, at the same time, had Donald Keene's course where we were reading all of Chikamatsu's plays. And so the idea of, of um, tragedy intrigued me. And so I um, went on to try to initially do comparative things, but then didn't follow that exactly. But my f the first book was on um, Chikamatsu and his plays, and particularly this, the concept of, of tragedy. Um, Japan has a living, uh, well, we have slides, don't we, actually, yeah. Uh, um, in, in looking at the, the plays when I farted, started doing it, one of the fascinating things about Japanese theater is that really there isn't, at least in the West, there isn't a comparative one that the, the theatrical tradition is completely alive. In other words, Shakespeare is performed today, but the tradition is broken several times. We don't have tradition of performer to performer to performer to performer from, as we do with the No or the puppet theater or Kabuki. So you have this live sense. And I became fascinated with that. And for example, on, this is a text of a play, which is really difficult. And uh, the ambassador's left, left, but I was going to ask him if he could read it. Uh, <laughs> um, but the, the, one of the fascinating things is that these texts were published with notation for the voice. And so, in a sense, these were practice tests. These were people read them out loud and they performed them even until more, more, much more recent times. So it's fun to explore this kind of aspect and as the way to bring the, the, the text to, to life. I, I, in order to take this further then, one, one, I guess one of the story is that one thing leads to another. And uh, then getting interested in this musical aspects, I wasn't a musicologist, so I got two uh, William Malm and, 
and uh, a Japanese musicologist to work together to explore the music and publish the book, uh, Theater is Music, on that. Then, because the puppet theater, which I dealt with, Shikamatsu, is based in Osaka, I decided I should do Osaka Kabuki. And this led to a whole another world, because when I approached Tim Clark, who's here, about doing an exhibition at the British Museum, because it turned out that when you start doing kabuki, it's different. This, this case is the text, but in kabuki, it's the performers. It's the, they, kabuki didn't publish text. The texts are the ephemeral moment of actual stage performance, and so it disappears each time. There's playwrights, but they write a new play every single time. So it's the actors who are in control, and the actors never gave up control like they did in, in Europe to directors and, uh, and the, the playwrights themselves. They were the bosses. And so it was the focus on the actor. And one of the things that became fascinating was, and this is an example of an actor, Sudimono. This is where I switched to becoming interested in the visual. Uh, because actors are at the bottom of Japanese society in the Tokugawa period. They're beyond the pale. There's this class system, but they're, they're virtually outcasts. They're non-people. But through the arts, and this is one of the things that's fascinating, I'll come back to just right at the end of my little talk, is that the um, through poetry, through haiku or other kinds of gatherings, they were able, and they're using their, a pen name, were able to circulate with all kinds of other people at different sort of levels, even though they were at the bottom. So one of the things they circulated with was samurai, with courtiers, with Buddhist priests, in a sense, and also women were able to participate in these sort of worlds. And one of the things that's fascinating is how extensive was the um, activity of people in performing groups, and which continues today, I suppose, in Bukatsudo at uh, high school or a university, this sense of socializing through club sort of activities. One of the fascinating things about Osaka Kabuki, different than Edo Kabuki, is that when they started representing the actors, they did it not as bijinga, not as beautiful pictures, but as men in drag. Uh, when they did it, and so this was sort of fascinating. They did realistic portraits compared to more the commercial aspect that was in, in Edo, in, in the Tokyo tradition. And I became fascinated with this. You can see here, the, I don't know if the actor would have been very happy with that. He's sort of chubby, big nose, he's got wrinkles. Uh, he looks, it is a man playing, performing a, a woman role. This was fascinating, as consciously done, this sort of tradition of realism. So I began looking, why, did this, why was this artist dealing with this, in this realism and looking for his, his teacher? And this was another one of those serendipity moments. I was at uh, Nichibunken, the uh, center in Kyoto, and looking for Sette's works, Tsukio Kasette, who was one of his teachers, and found this book, which was published in 1989 in Switzerland, a small publisher, which was a facsimile of a Sette illustrated book. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a completely Japanese style with a chitsu and the whole sort of thing. It would have been a very expensive, but it was um, a shunga book. <laughs> it was a book, a parody of a, of a woman, of a conduct book, a very, you know, a serious sort of conduct book, and I started reading it. This was weird. It was a, it was, this was published in Germany, well, Switzerland, in, in Zurich uh, by a, a German uh, author, and it had been owned by uh, a, a scholar from the early part of the century. Just tell me when I'm, my time's going on here. Nearly up, okay. <laughs> it won't last much longer. The, uh, the, the fascination was that the book, even though it was erotic and, and lively, was serious. It was also it was presenting a different type of ideal woman, well, a lively one, a partner in a conjugal rela relationship. And so I became, then I looked and there wasn't any research on this. And the, the Onna Daigaku, this parody of Onna, the, the other one, no one knew about it anymore. So it was like, what's the matter? Why is it something that's disappeared? And then I realized it's taboo. So then again, approached the British Museum, and this led to the, the big Shunga exhibition. But finally, finally, <laughs> um, there's a, a censored picture. <laughs> Tsukiya Kosette. But finally, I'm sort of now looking to return to this theme of the way that these aesthetic salons, the poetry salons, art salons, performing salons, were such an in, in, absolutely essential element of Edo period society that continues into the modern, but particularly even post-war, but at least into the Taisho sort of period, as the, the fundamental way that people socialized. 
And the, one of the import, important things is that when you entered one of these groups, you took a pen name. So you've left your status behind. There's a clear indication that these were egalitarian, even sometimes the Japanese called them utopian spaces, temporary spaces. But these were the ones where they collaborated and supported the arts, uh, painting, book publishing, all sorts of things. And so this is the stage I'm at now of, of returning to this idea. This is a, one where an art, the, the Kabuki actor, the courtier, Kyoto courtier, was working with um, uh, Kabuki actors. And this is a commemoration when the fellows died. They all got to get this magnificent, uh, this piece. It's just a huge um, print piece that they published in, in commemoration. So just that, I guess it's just the, the fascination of Japan and then the leading from one thing to another is uh, my little theme, I suppose. Thank you. Um, right, um, I'm representing here religion, um, a field that has been studied uh, uh, for almost 20 years at SOAS. This is my 20th year at SOAS, actually. And um, um, it's been studied in various ways. Uh, but I'm going to continue a bit, uh, serendipitously, the, the, the talk that you started, because while religion is traditionally studied uh, uh, through text with a, an interest in doctrine of one or the other school, I've been interested in uh, um, studying it in uh, performative and visual terms. Um, and in looking at uh, uh, religion um, in terms of the intersections between uh, different uh, um, lineages or between uh, um, traditions that are understood uh, as uh, discrete, but that in fact have many more um, uh, uh, points of contact. And I'm afraid uh, to say that despite I'm one of the few women uh, in the field, I'm working really on the world of men. They are mostly men practitioners. Um, so I, I, I thought I'll give you two examples of um, what I've been doing on this. And one um, has to do with the strategies of ritualization that transformed um, a, a text, and in this case I have a, a very important text in the uh, East Asian tradition, the Lotus Sutra, um, that is usually interpreted you know, doctrinally by um, uh, Tendai schools, by, by very important philosophical uh, representatives, but that in Japan, received uh, great attention from the point of view of tantric Buddhism. And uh, um, in terms, especially in terms of ritual, of tantric ritual, um, where um, each of the uh, elements of the scriptures, whether the, the Buddhas or the stupas, became elements in the ritual procedures performed in front of uh, Kami and Buddhas, actually, and produced uh, new iconographies, a mandala of the Lotus Sutra, such as the two examples of it. And this is particularly interesting because it's not, from, I'm, I'm, I'm basically a medievalist, a historian of religion focusing on the medieval period, but stretching on both sides of this very long period in Japanese history. But this is a very important um, uh, example in Nikko in the Tokugawa period. Um, it, it, what is interesting about this, this type of uh, a mandalization of a scripture, ritualization of a scripture, is that uh, in turn, um, icons produced in Japan excuse me, in Japan, um, served as a um, as model uh, to, to shape other icons and other uh, interpretations of, um, of Buddhism um, and of its devotional practices. And uh, I've spent a lot of my time working on uh, the way in which a monk that is not usually um, associated with tantric uh, schools called Nichiren, as a 13th century monk, uh, reimagined the images that you've seen just before in a calligraphic way, um, a, 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 an iconography that became a very important object of worship and that in turn um, uh, uh, propelled uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, um, visualizations of the sutra. Um, the second example I wanted to give you has to do with uh, the uh, symbiotic relation between Buddhism and what today we call Shinto. Um, and uh, uh, there I've been interested in uh, the way in which uh, um, Japanese interpreters uh, um, devised uh, a combinatory 
uh, understanding of the gods of Japan. And even uh, um, a, date, a main deity of what we uh, today consider the, the, the Shinto pantheon, such as Amaterasu that you see there, um, in uh, um, some historical periods was understood as, uh, uh, in a Buddhist shape as a Buddhist deity. Uh, we see it here riding a horse as a, um, as a, a Bodhisattva, uh, or here uh, in a double form as the Buddha Dainichi, with all the um, elements of uh, um, accessories of a Buddhist deity. And such interpretations of Shinto, what we call Shinto, uh, Shinto thinks, let's say, affected also the, um, uh, the uh, envisioning of the uh, regalia, of the symbols of uh, um, imperial power. Now here I have um, an example that is actually at the British Museum, one of the most eminent examples of how the Buddhist saw the, um, the sacred regalia, um, that became vajras and uh, uh, stupas, the five element stupas. And uh, this, is a, a, um, this is not just a medieval type of understanding because many of the images we have are actually from the 18th, uh, 17th, 18th century and uh, done recently research in uh, parts of Japan uh, um, where uh, archives are not very much looked in terms of religious um, uh, elements and there are many of these representations uh, um, across the country. Um, the very last uh, thing uh, has to do with the, the way in which the importance of conceptualizing practice in visual terms reached um, almost its extreme in uh, the uh, way in which practitioners reimagined their bodies. Um, this is what I've called mandalic bodies. Um, many archives in, uh, um, in recent years that I've been privileged to work at have unveiled a great number of uh, diagrams and visualizations of the body. The body remained, seemed to have remained uh, extremely important in, uh, in the Japanese thinking um, about religious practice. Um, so the, the body is reimagined as a mandala, all these little uh, um, uh, letters that you see there are deities, the deities of the mandalas, and uh, um, is put at the center of the process of the generation of the sacred. Um, and, and so it is transformed, the dualism of the human body uh, is transformed in the uh, perfected moment that can uh, deliver salvation. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, images uh, of uh, uh, the beginning of an embryological process that uh, um, uh, engendered uh, sacralization in Japan. And again, uh, these are medieval things, but there are plenty of it in the, um, uh, in the Meiji period as well. Um, and I'll stop here, thank you. We're using this, oh. Okay. It, it's more important to look at the, uh, the screen, but I don't mind you looking at me if you wish to do so. Um, just put on a stopwatch so I don't speak for too long. So I'll add my congratulations to, uh, to um, ourselves. It's, it's not often that you get to say that, but it's of course not a single person's project. The ambassador said that no country uh, can operate on their own, and as academics, we all know no scholar operates on their own. We all know by learn, learn what we know by, by speaking to each other. So the GRC has always been a fantastic um, space in which we can do that. And I understand that thanks to um, friendship uh, across uh, Japan and Britain, we now have additional sponsorship for our Wednesday uh, seminars, and this may uh, lead to slightly better wine being offered in the future. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, give you a little sort of personal anecdote to link into my research sp 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 talk. Uh, some, some students in the room hear me talk about my work and some uh, colleagues hear me talk, we all talk to each other. But of course, a lot of our experiences, as Professor Gerstel intimated, they come out of actually very personal experiences. We bumped into something, we did something, we talked to somebody. It wasn't exactly an academic event that generated an academic idea. So in my case, it was I walked the Tokai door. And as you all know, the Tokaido is the road that links Edo to Kyoto, uh, or Kyoto to Edo. Uh, it's almost exactly 500 kilometers. If it had one more bend in it, it would have been exactly 500 kilometers. It's 498.6, <laughs> which given that they didn't have a concept of kilometers, is quite amazing. 
Um, so anyway, I walked. It takes 13 days of continuous walking uh, all through the day without any stops. But it's not a difficult walk, and it's a um, one that almost everyone that we work on as historians of Japan up until the present period did. And I wanted on my own body to experience what it was to walk this road that almost everyone I'd ever read about um, had done. And all sorts of things come into your mind as you walk, as some um, elderly person told me along the way, that your mind controls your hands, but your feet control your mind. And you do think a lot of things as you're walking for 14, 13, 14 days nonstop. Anyway, walking on Tokaido then are many beautiful parts. It's not all beautiful, but some uh, parts are very beautiful. And this is one going through the mountains not very far from the foot of Mount Fuji. And just to prove it, there I am. <laughs> um, but within Mount, of course, the athletic experience, many people did it. But one thing particularly stands out as an Edo historian uh, and also a reader of Japanese literature is the tales of Ise. So one of the greatest classics of Japanese literature that continue to be read throughout history, pretty much, and it's just had a new Penguin Classics translation appeared, the tales of Issei. It's fairly random stories from round about the year 950, but one important section of it tells of a person who takes the Tok Tokaido Highway. This person who's not named, just called The Man, walks for, out of Kyoto. He's sick of Kyoto. He doesn't want to be there anymore. He walks off into the countryside, and he experiences um, all these places along the way. Now, that book was a proprietorial text owned by the court. We should remember that much of what we today call Japanese literature was owned by families. And you couldn't just read it. You couldn't buy copies of it. Even if you did, you couldn't understand it without a lot of exegetical material. And that suddenly was changed in the early Edo period. So something that we might call Japanese literature comes into being at that time. And as an art historian, I'm interested in, of course, whether illustrations work with that. The so-called saga editions, the first time that the Issei was published, easily to read. These are very large books. It's almost, it's way bigger than A4 page. Text is very spread out, so almost anyone can read it. And it's, of course, also illustrated. We see two points here along the way. The Tokaido from going, he went from Kyoto, I walked from Tokyo the other way, same effect. But he's going past, first of all, um, a spot called the Eight Bridges, followed by Mount Fuji. And along the path this... Um, person in the story takes, we can pinpoint things along the real road. And subsequent travelers would, as they walk, think to themselves, that man in the ancient story, when he was at this spot, this real actual spot that I'm walking past now because the road has not changed, he thought this, and he wrote that verse. And so somebody would then try to conjure up in their own mind the same sort of feeling, and they might even write a verse that um, linked to that. I was not able to do that, unfortunately. But people who um, traveled also then created these spots along the Tokaido in their own gardens. Almost any so-called Japanese garden today will have one wonky bridge in it. Right? <laughs> Always has, right? Why? Because it's that eight-plank bridge that begins the story of the man's exit from Kyoto and moving to the west. When he sat there, as the, as the original text tells you, he and his friends wrote a verse on the theme of the sadness of travel, the regret about leaving people that you love behind, and the verse that they wrote was so poignant that they wept into their rice, which swelled up from the salt of their tears. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful idea. Of course, it's, it's an overstatement. So people could, that could walk, that had to walk along the road for business purposes, for mere pleasure as I did, or for pilgrimages, would think about these things along the way. People who could not walk along the highway, not everyone could take the time off. Women would find it very difficult to find excuses to walk. They would recreate in the space of a garden a similar spot where you could then think the same feelings. Uh, and that is really what the Tokaido was doing for people throughout much of history. But my final point is that if you walk along past this place called the Eight Plank Bridges, beyond uh, towards Fuji, you pass Shizuoka, which is where the Tokugawa family castle was. Tokugawa retired to Shizuoka. So actually what happens in the Edo period is this old story, which you can now walk because the road's in nice condition, becomes a story of Tokugawa power. The Eight Plank Bridge, or the Eight Bridges, you can translate it different ways, is where the Tokugawa family originated from. And they themselves made their own journey uh, to this area where they formed the family castle, and then went over Fuji, and then they ended up governing from Edo. And in Edo, you see their um, 
uh, Mount Fuji rising behind, and beyond Mount Fuji is the road that takes you to Kyoto. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, no, I struggle with um, feeling appropriate and socially appropriate, so can you give me just a moment here? Um, so this is my 10th year at SOAS, and, and I'm a historian of, of gender and class. I brought out my first book in my first year here at SOAS, and I just finished uh, my second monograph over this summer. And it'll come out uh, next year. Um, so instead of going into sort of the, the, the overview of the book, which is titled here, Mobilizing Japanese Youth, um, I thought I would share uh, one chapter. Uh, one, one, one part of the, of the story that I narrate. Um, the, the whole book is an examination of a conflict between generations, uh, the trans-war generation, those who had grown up and come of age as teenagers in the 1920s and 1930s, who after World War II reassumed control and power in Japan and their conflict with the, the children who were born in the uh, late 40s and 50s and come of age in the late 1960s and early 1970s. This conflict for control is something that continues on well into the 1980s. Um, I'm particularly interested in extremist politics, and so in this book, I look at how the far right and the far left are seeking to mobilize this young generation of Japanese in the late 1960s and, and 1970s. Uh, one chapter looks specifically at the emergence of the uh, Kagekiha, the, the, the radical leftist factions of the late 60s and early 1970s, uh, here pictured um, in their battle dress uh, as they are marching on Haneda Airport uh, in 1968. <laughs> Uh, the, the battles uh, that, that emerge in Tokyo and Osaka, the, called the Osaka War and the Tokyo War of 1969, are really quite contentious. Um, they determine the overall course of radical politics in Japan. And uh, some historians get uh, lost in, in the maze of ideologies, and, and I'm not interested in the com competition of ideologies. I'm interested more in how various political factions are seeking to use uh, their ideas to mobilize and, and, and persuade young people to engage in uh, radical politics to the point of th throwing bombs, uh, robbing banks, um, and engaging in terrorist activities. Um, central to this chapter is the story of Shigenobu Fusako, who is one of the founders of Sekigun, or the Japanese Red Army. What's interesting about Shigenobu is that she's often misunderstood as just another university radical. Uh, what's fascinating about her is that she was a night school student at university. She was working the day as an OL, as an office lady at the Kikoman Corporation. She came from what some student radicals refer to as a petit bourgeois family, but actually her father was an alcoholic failed shopkeeper, and her family grew up in significant, with significant financial disparity. So that when she was looking at her life at the age of 16 or 17, she, goes, she chose to go to vocational school. Uh, to become um, a, an office worker and, and didn't dream of university until the idea was introduced to her at Kikoman by one of her fellow workers who said, hey, you can go to night school at Waseda, right? Oh, excuse me, at Meiji, excuse me, Meiji University. Um, over the course of the 1960s, she becomes deeply involved in radical politics and by the late 1960s, she's hanging out with a group of musicians. Uh, among others. And, and, and so as I'm writing this chapter and, and, and developing this story, I, I, I got to um, delve into the emergence of, of punk rock in Japan. Zuno Keisatsu was a garage band or a garage rock band that by the early 1970s is responsible for uh, releasing the first uh, proto-punk rock album, not just in Japan, but it dates about six months before the release of the first punk rock album anywhere. Right? 
And um, so in, in pulling this together, uh, pulling this story together, we get to look at their first release, um, which has the first three tracks, uh, which the fans call the Revolutionary Trilogy, and its overlap with Sekigun, or the, or the Japanese Red Army. The declaration of World Revolutionary War, which is often considered to be an anthem of the radical bomb throwers of the early 1970s, in its release of March 1972, is uh, the, the, lead, the lead singer Panta, or Nakamura's, uh, interpretation of the 1969 manifesto of the Japanese Red Army, as it screamed out in this angry, vibrant recitation, uh, accompanied by firecrackers to mimic gunfire. Then moving on into the, 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 the poetry of the Red Army soldier, and then the final, the final track of the revolutionary trilogy, pick up a gun, pick up a gun, pick up a gun. Um, it's released and banned within five weeks. No surprise. Six weeks later, the Japanese Red Army launches the first airport terrorist attack in history. This is the attack at Lod Airport in Tel Aviv. Uh, the three uh, airport attackers, the three terrorists, Okamoto Kozo, Yasuda Yasuyuki, and Okutaira Tsuyoshi, were recruited and trained by Shigenobu uh, in, in camps of the Palestine, Palestinian uh, uh, PFLP, people, people's uh, uh, Liberation Army for Palestinian Liberation, alongside uh, other uh, radicals, including the Red Army faction from uh, West Germany and the Red Brigades from Italy. This is the emergence of 1970s terrorism. In the aftermath of the attack, Japan goes through a, a, this moment when the international face of terrorism is Japanese. And how people respond to this uh, is, is fascinating in looking at the conflict between the generations um, um, in the late 1970s and into the 1980s as part of what the book does. Anyway, so that's, look for the book, it'll be out next year. Um, and uh, we'll move on to Helen now, thank you. Not sure I really prepared this part actually. <laughs> um, so my journey is uh, from textiles to rugby, I'm calling it. Um, it's taken place for over 20 years now. Um, I started off for my PhD looking at women in the textile industry. Uh, it would be nice to say that I came out of that uh, being able to make beautiful textiles, but unfortunately that was not true. I looked at that industry because it was a big employer of women in Japan in the pre-war and post-war years. And in particular, I was looking at the post-war years to see how they had remodeled the image of the, of the uh, industry, which was accused of exploiting female workers in the pre-war. And in particular, I looked at that industry uh, looking at how it set a blueprint. I argued it set a blueprint for how women were employed in post-war Japan. And many of those threads we can see running through post-war Japan, for example, um, employing older women just as part-time workers and not as full-time workers. So that was my first um, study. And from that, I moved into um, looking at the same time period, so moving away from this rising demand for female labor and industries like the textiles wanting women to come and work for them because of economic growth and economic demand, looking at um, women as consumers as well. So the growing affluence of, of women working and, and men working and growing wages and women as consumers, particularly of um, home appliances. And as we know, Japan was building up its electronic and home appliances business uh, manufacturing at this period in time, the 60s and 70s. And in particular, I focused on one home appliance you can see there, the automatic rice cooker, which was um, pioneered by Toshiba, the first one in the world where you could put rice and water in there, turn it on, go away, do nothing, come back, and you had perfectly cooked rice. So I was looking at the technology of that. I was looking at how they used women for advertising. But I was also looking to see how these time-saving appliances released women from the chore of housework and therefore, of course, enabled them to work part-time and things like that. So there was a connection to my previous study. 
Um, over the years, I've continued to look at this issue of gender and work. Um, more recently, I've looked, of course, at, at policy, abenomics, womanomics, looking at gender equality in the workplace. Over 20 years, you can dip in and out of it and see what's changed. Sometimes it seems like not much has changed. Sometimes it seems like there is progress being made. Um, so I've been writing about that recently as well, and particularly arguing that womenomics will not work in Japan unless men are included in womenomics as well. So really, it should be gendernomics. It, that women can't go into a, a, a Japanese employment system that is designed for men. Um, it just won't work. So that has been my argument in, in that um, sphere. Then I did a project on sport. Um, and this actually was something I came across during my PhD. I was looking at, as I said, the textile industry. And um, there was uh, volleyball was played in textile companies for a very long time. And it was about giving the workers um, some physical exercise after working in factories all day. It was about you know, well-being and teamwork and health building. So for a very long time, textile companies invested in volleyball. But they became so good at it and competitive at it in the 60s that this one team won the women's gold medal for volleyball at the Tokyo 1964 Olympics. And that team was basically one textile company's team. They were so good. Um, so I looked at that story. I went back to my PhD and, and looked at that again. And I also looked at the spread of volleyball after that, and particularly the spread to what they call mama-san volleyball. So uh, the spread of sports to housewives uh, and mothers. So not just young women playing sport, but older women being encouraged to play sport as well. So that was that project. And that led me to look at the staging of the Tokyo 64 Olympics as well and what it meant to stage a mega sporting event. And that has led me into my project that I'm working on now. Um, so, sorry, they were called the Witches of the Orient. They were nicknamed the Witches of the Orient, that team that won the 1964 gold medal. Um, and I've come across this team that have been nicknamed the Iron Men of the North. Um, and they played rugby. Um, that's the team on the left. That's their seventh consecutive win in the All Japan Championships. And that team uh, was from Kamaishi. Um, and many of you may know that Kamaishi is in the Tohoku region, was one of the, the cities very badly hit in the tsunami. And uh, Japan next year is staging the Rugby World Cup. So this is another big sporting mega event, uh, building up to Tokyo 2020, of course, in the following year. And basically, it, it leads on from textiles in the same way that textile companies were looking for a sport to provide well-being and teamwork and... and uh, and eventually a competitive sport for women, T uh, iron and steel industries and iron and steel companies in Japan used rugby as the sport for men. It was seen as an appropriate masculine sport for men to play. Um, and those teams became very competitive and good um, at rugby as well. Uh, basically, I was just looking for an excuse to go out for field work next year and watch the All Blacks win the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> so hopefully I can do that. Um, but the threads go through there, and Kamaishi is very interesting because it's the only purpose-built stadium. So the Rugby World Cup will be staged in 12 cities across Japan, and Kamaishi is the only purpose-built stadium. Um, and it's very significant because it's built on the grounds of uh, the junior high school and elementary school that were completely wiped out in the tsunami. And therefore, the staging of it in this small town is quite symbolic. And rugby has been used by the town to re-energize the town. So rugby is used in these slogans there, and the slogan, I'm standing there, that's a little bit of field work there, um, to reinvigorate people and get people behind the rebuilding of the region. Uh, so that's my, my current project. Thank you. Right, thank you, Helen, um, for putting this all together. I do, when you look at this um, heading, In Search of Sino-Japanese Relations, um, you could pointedly say that there isn't much to look for because Japanese and Chinese relations are notoriously bad. However, I have tried um, to venture into that as I was also traveling Europe to come here because it was as well uh, as much a pers personal journey as it was an academic one. I started my career as a PhD candidate in a project looking at how Japan appropriated other Asian countries based at the University of Trier, which is, um, for those of you not familiar with German geography, basically 
pretty close to in the middle of nowhere. It's a um, very beautiful campus in the middle of nowhere. It's very green um, and belongs to a very small and very insignificant city. So nothing ever be, um, was set out for me to end up at SOAS in London. However, shortly before completing my PhD, I, by chance, as um, many other things happened in, uh, this, in these talks, um, SOAS had a job opening, and within five minutes of this job opening um, being released through the European Association for Japanese Studies mailing list, about five people had sent me the advert, so I applied, not thinking I would indeed end up here, but I ended up here in quite the opposite of the middle of nowhere, finishing my PhD and um, here on, and eventually also publishing it as a book. So I did find some Sino-Japanese relations, albeit only on screen. And I've put it here because it is part of the SOA series, um, in Studies in Modern and Contemporary Japan. So um, there is a little SOA's logo on the book, which is uh, I'm very proud of. However, as it always happens with um, professional and academic journeys, there are a lot of loose ends. Um, lying around when you complete a research. In my case, um, I'm still working busily, as you can see, and tying them up. So my loose ends are um, more memory, because um, at some stage during my project, I had to leave out uh, images of wartime China, representations of wartime China in the contemporary as well as in the present. So um, it's by no means that um, Japanese war memory tends to concentrate on the perhaps most iconic picture I put here. Um, there are many more facets to Japanese war memory than we tend to think here. And um, also the production context that shapes these kinds of productions. What can be, be produced? How can it be produced? So, um, in particular, currently, under the current government, there is a lot of debate about what kind of direction the media can take, what kind of function the media can fulfill. And that then, in a sense, also leads to how things, even if it is fiction, can be produced and what is acceptable to be uh, to put out there. And my journey is far from being complete, but I hope to be able to continue here at SOAS because uh, it was one of the best chances um, to actually really end up here in such a vibrant research environment as the JRC is. And uh, with this, I pass on to something very related. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is uh, Ryotaro Mihara. Um, I am an anthropologist and a uh, lecturer in international management in Japan and Korea at the School of Finance and Management. Well, what one might ask, uh, how can anthropologists be hired at the School of Finance and Management? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, well, it, we, it sounds like, you know, a bit like commercialized anthropologists, you know, and, and it sounds like less anthropological, but, but that's another story. Oh, by the way, we, we have real anthropologists next to me, so... <laughs> uh, so uh, um, but um, as, the, as shown, I, I would like to talk about the, the, my latest research fieldwork uh, relating to the anime. Um, so as shown here, I'm interested in the global spread of anime, um, uh, Japanese animation, by the way. Japanese animation is called anime. So, uh, so my overarching question is how can we understand this uh, phenomenon, the global spread of um, anime? And my aspiration is in understanding um, what does it mean for Japan and what does it mean for Asia and for the world uh, at large. So, um, so here, here are some kind of spectacularly symbolic uh, picture that shows anime's global popularity. So they are all pictures of um, anime conventions being held um, around the world, including at Mumbai, Manila, Los Angeles, Paris, and London, of course. Um, 
and they attract hundreds of thousands of people every year, and, um, they, and the numbers of attendants are uh, continuously growing. So, um, so definitely something is going on, and um, many people have tried to give intellectual explanations to uh, this global spread of anime. So, uh, so there's a, a kind of a brief list of the, the accumulation of debate. You know, some, some argue that it, it enhances Japan's soft power. It, some another, uh, other people argue it will save Japanese economy. It is another way of Japanism. It, it enhances more re reciprocal creative exchange. It is due to anime's high quality as artworks. It nuances the consumer experience. It recenters globalization. It is a sign of the rise of the pulse for this lifestyle. Um, and it subverts the global dominance of Hollywood. So these are all the kind of uh, the accumulation of the list of the, what um, uh, has been uh, already discussed uh, in terms uh, in regarding the, uh, uh, the global spread of Japanese animation. But um, what I myself found in this um, um, accumulation of debate is that they don't really look at uh, the business people uh, involved in, in, in anime. Uh, the main focus of the previous arguments is uh, anime's creators and fans, and most of them are not based on their observations regarding uh, the business side of anime. And I find, found this void uh, is, is very kind of counterintuitive um, because anime is one of the most commercially oriented um, enterprises in any other forms of animation in the world. So, um, so what I decided to do uh, uh, in, is the, decided to see anime's globalization from the perspective of its business people, um, hoping to provide different intellectual angle um, in understanding anime's globalization. So I conducted a one year, uh, 12 months field work in an entrepreneurial startup venture um, that tried to expand anime business from Japan to India. Um, why I choose India is another story, but uh, the company's objective is to establish an Indo-Japanese online merchandising uh, platform through which the uh, Japanese animation sector could distribute its products to the Indian market. In order to streamline that transnational flow of anime goods, um, Ikeyama-san, the, the, uh, the, 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 the person in the center, uh, Ikeyama-san, the founding entrepreneur, oh, by the way, Kiyama is a fake, fake uh, name, so you, you cannot find anyone by, by searching it. <laughs> so, Ikeyama san, uh, he's the founding entrepreneur in, in, in my central fieldwork interlocutor. So he kind of negotiated both with Japan, Japanese anime sector in Tokyo and uh, Indian distributors in Delhi. So I, I accompanied Ikeyama san and observed all his kind of activities uh, that, he, that took place. Um, so these are the pictures I took in the field. <laughs> So a uh, picture on the left, this is me, uh, obviously, um, attending Japanese Popular Culture Festival in, held in Delhi and welcome in the in Indian way. And the picture on the upper right-hand side, uh, that, 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 that uh, man in, in, in white shirt, he, he's, he's a camera, huh? um, so he's, that I, I took his picture he, while he's working in, in his office in Tokyo. And the pictures on the uh, lower left-hand side is the picture of Ikeyama-san negotiating one of his pro prospective business partner in Delhi. So I took this uh, picture in Delhi, and they are kind of discussing the provisions of um, uh, joint venture agreements. So I kind of do, did, did, did this kind of field work in the 2014 and 15. And um, I am now uh, kind of working on this ethnography to make it into uh, the monograph. And I'm, I'm kind of still exploring the theoretical implications of the field work, but um, what I am preliminary thinking uh, is that the global uh, spread of anime tells us well, a bit less about how people are already connected globally, but um, more about how people pr uh, proactively make transnational connections uh, in terms of their differences, like differences in you know, the, the, the business custom between Japan and and, and in India, or the differences between creators and business people. Um, so, or, uh, so I think they by by um, by um, you know. Um, so I, I think that how people by having the perspective of the business aspects might kind of give some kind of implications of this kind of the proactive connection creating um, activities. So um, previous ar arguments on anime's globalization is a bit too euphoric in in my way in my view in celebrating how we are connected in terms of anime. So how we are already connected 
in terms of anime. But on the other hand, uh, the business perspective of anime's globalization would, I believe, highlight the dynamics of the moment in which we proactively make connections by overcoming our differences, like Ikema-san tried to do, what hard to do in, in, in his business, which is still continuing and his uh, company is still growing. So that is good for anthropologists to have this kind of continuous relationship with the, uh, with the interlocutors. But that is um, uh, what I am doing right now um, in this the introduction for uh, my research. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. I'm the last obstacle between you and the sake, so I'll try to make it um, very short. And uh, uh, it's actually quite interesting to see that uh, Mihara-san and I, we share quite a lot of uh, things. Obviously, we're both anthropologists. We both work on animation, although, um, as you will see, uh, in a quite different sense. And we all perhaps have, uh, um, as anthropologists, a slight fetish for diagrams, because I also, um, I'm just gonna, I want to show you later on, I came up with this diagram. And because I only just got here, I don't really have a, a book to peddle or anything. I would just uh, like to make a brief argument about the idea of animism. My first field work was on hoarding in Japan. So I was working with people who can't throw things away, helping them clean out their flats. And when doing so, um, what often struck me was that there's sort of two different kinds of explanations that are being put forward. On one side, if you talk to folklorists or to um, Japanese cultural commentators or experts, they all say, well, it may have to do with the idea that in Shintoism, you have a notion that things are imbued with life, that there is some kind of soul in things. And this can also be applied to modern material culture. This is something that has very long roots here. On the left side, you can see uh, an illustration for the, from the Tsukumogamiki. Then you have uh, sort of a robot. And of course, dolls as being sort of a, a connecting element. So this idea is still around and of course um, the Japanese government is very interesting in promoting this idea because the idea that robots are also inhabited by souls will allow you to uh, take care for the elderly with a brand new robot population. Um, so I was thinking about this idea of animism and techno-animism. Uh, uh, this is the way it is currently formulated and I'm, I'm not going to bore you with the details. I'm just, I just want to um, illustrate a different way to think about animism uh, as animation. So literally not as a form of belief, but as a form of ritual technology that allows you to imbue things with life. So when we talk about that, and here's the diagram, um, <laughs> you may want to think um, of the different ways in which a thing can come to life. And so I, I use a lot of highfalutin words here. On one side of the self, you have the idea of cathexis. A thing can come alive if it's perceived to become one with the body of the person who uses it. And this is, of course, a very uh, well -spread, uh, widespread notion in martial arts. Uh, here, Chiba Katsuo Sensei, for example, with the sword. On the other side, you have the living national treasure, Yoshimura Yuki, using the fan. So this is a, a very well established idea. The thing becomes one with you. It becomes part of your body, your life force extends through it. But that relationship ends as soon as you put it down. So what happens if you move towards the other direction, the, the direction of non-self, when things become different from you? And there you have a completely different idea of opacity. Things become sort of secretly imbued with life because they're opaque, because we don't know what's happening, because we don't know what they are thinking. And of course, sometimes, as in the example on the far right, uh, actually statues do come to life. This is the uh, Mikari no Buddha from, uh, Mikari no Amida from um, the Eikando in Kyoto uh, that miraculously sort of came down from the altar uh, when the priest Eikan was worshiping it. So you have a, an idea of animation that is on the other side of the spectrum, that is not familiar, that is non-self. And then, of course, you have all kinds of material culture that is in between, that constantly changes from being self and non-self. But there's another sense in which we can say a thing can come to life, and that is when it resists us. So the idea of recalcitrance down there, 
and um, that's quite interesting. There's uh, a very interesting uh, research being done on the IBO. This is the new version of the IBO, and if you have an IBO, you know, of course, if you use it in a, t in a traditional room, uh, it is quite likely to poke its head through the Shoji screen. Now, when you talk to the engineers, they will say, well, it's because the sensors can't pick up the paper. But if you talk to the owners, they will say, no, 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 because it's, a, it's the Uchi no Yanchan Aibo. It's, it's our mischievous little uh, Aibo who does that, right? So there's a, a very different understanding of personality and personhood. But that, and this is the final point, is of course not something that is unique to Japan in many ways. You can see here on the other side, uh, Basil Fawlty, um, sort of castigating uh, his car in faulty towers uh, in something that Alfred Gell, the anthropologist, called vehicular animism. And I think uh, we would all believe in vehicular animism because if the car breaks down, especially at a point in time when you really need to use it, there's no way you understand that event without attributing some kind of malevolent agency <laughs> to the car. But nobody, therefore, would say, oh, the British are animists, right? <laughs> so that will end with that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to say thank you for coming along and celebrating with us. I hope we've given you an insight into the 40 years of the JRC and the kinds of very many topics that we study here. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and I want to, there's no Q&A, it's a celebration, so I want to invite you to step out the door and join us for wine and sake and food. Um, if you go ahead, I want to invite all the JRC members, everybody who's a member of the JRC, to come up here for a celebratory photo. Everybody else go ahead and start drinking and we'll join you in a second. Thank you for coming.